Right now on NBC 26 Live at 10, two people are dead tonight after Sheboygan County Sheriff's Department say two men were shot to death in a home. Plus, President Trump pushing the GOP not to give up on repealing and replacing the Affordable Care Act. And some good news for frequent flyers, the FAA taking another look at airplane seat sizes. Good evening. We begin with developing news tonight. Two people were found shot to death overnight at a home in the village of Oosburg. According to the Sheboygan County Sheriff's Department, it happened on the 400 block of North 10th Street. The sheriff's office says a person of interest has been taken into custody. Neighbors say they frequently saw young men going in and out of the home, and something like this is very unusual for the small village. It's unbelievable um, for our community. We're very a very close-knit community, and everyone knows their neighbors and cares about everyone. Um, this is just shocking. Now, this is still an ongoing investigation. Deputies say there is no danger to the public at this time. Grand Chute Police say a 27-year-old woman has died after being hit by a car last week. Police identified the woman as Megan Rogers from Appleton. Last Wednesday night, Rogers was taken to a hospital with life-threatening injuries after getting hit by a vehicle on West Prospect Avenue and Northern Road. Police say this is an ongoing investigation. Manitowoc police say an 18-year-old man has been arrested after allegedly assaulting officers. The incident happened early Saturday. According to police, the man was acting irrationally and suspected of being under the influence of drugs and alcohol. Police say he was led back to an ambulance for medical treatment, and that's when he became physically combative, biting and spitting on officers. The man is now at the Manitowoc County Jail. Well, switching gears, it was humid and warm today. Will it change at all for the work week ahead? Let's check in with meteorologist Matt Hoffman. Hello, Matt. Hey, Regina. Yeah, we are going to still see this humid and warm air mass stick around for the coming days. So it will be on the humid side, and that will also lead to some storm chances over the next few days as well. Currently 69 degrees in Green Bay, that dew point up to 68 degrees. So it is pretty humid out there. We could even see a little bit of patchy fog overnight. Temperature is still very mild in the upper 60s to lower 70s this hour. Radar is quiet. Those showers we saw up to the north have come to an end and a few thunderstorms as well. Here's a look at your forecast as we head on into Monday. Highs will be well into the 80s, humid with a few spotty hit and miss storm chances in the afternoon. We'll talk more about that and a full look at your work week forecast coming up. Well, a new sheriff comes to the White House tomorrow as General John Kelly takes over as chief of staff. Republicans say they hope Kelly will bring stability to the West Wing. This as President Trump pushes the GOP to not give up on repealing and replacing Obamacare. NBC's Jennifer Johnson has our story. <laughs> President Trump having a Saturday night dinner at his Washington, D.C. hotel with incoming Chief of Staff General John Kelly. Insiders hope Kelly will bring order to a chaotic White House, even over new communications director Anthony Scaramucci, who has openly and graphically criticized other cabinet members. On Monday, staffers expect to learn about the new chain of command. I will speak with General Kelly and the president about that, as I'm sure Anthony Scaramucci will. We're very, I think we're all very curious and very excited to have our first formal meeting. Some Republicans believe a less dysfunctional White House under Kelly will help the president get his agenda back on track. I think he will bring some order and discipline to the West Wing. What we need now from a chief of staff is ensuring that everybody who works in the White House is on the president's agenda. The president was unhappy former chief of staff Reince Priebus couldn't get the GOP to deliver on health care. But he's still pushing that, tweeting Sunday, don't give up Republican senators, the world is watching, repeal and replace. 83 insurance companies fled the health insurance market last year. That's before this administration came in. This system is imploding upon itself and that's what we're trying to take care of. But Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has said it's time to move on. Jennifer Johnson, NBC News, Washington. And the United States has sent two B-1 bombers over the Korean Peninsula in a show of force against North Korea. That's part of the administration's response to recent North Korean missile tests. NBC's Janice Mackey Freyer has the latest on reaction to the tests from Seoul, South Korea. 
The U.S. flew two B-1B bombers early today that met up with fighter jets from Japan and South Korea. They all performed a low pass over Osan Air Base before the U.S. bombers returned to Guam. As well, the U.S. confirming the successful test of anti-missile defense systems in Alaska. There have been a series of tests recently, all meant to fortify the coast against any potential threat from North Korea. This is all coming in the 48 hours since North Korea tested its latest long-range missile that experts believe could reach major cities in the United States. The concern, of course, is the lack of any clear U.S. strategy, and that's creating anxiety here in Asia, where allies appear to be concerned that America might not be there to back them. South Korea says it has entered talks to acquire stronger missiles, and it's also ordered the quick deployment of the anti-missile defense system that the government suspended in May. As well, Japan says it's going to add to its missile defenses. All of this, of course, will infuriate China, which has already been reluctant to help the U.S. reign in the North, and diplomacy certainly not helped by those tweets by President Trump, where he openly and publicly tried to shame China into doing something. So as ever, there is anxiety in Northeast Asia and no clear strategy to deal with it. Now back to you. Officials said today that police disrupted the first alleged plot in Australia to bring down an airplane and arrested four men in Sydney. Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull said that security has been increased at Sydney Airport since Thursday because of the alleged plot. The increased security measures was extended to all major international and domestic terminals around Australia overnight. The suspect's properties are continuing to be searched. Police found items in the homes used to make a bomb. No charges have yet been filed. Well, a van plowed into a crowd of people at a busy intersection in, Lo in Los Angeles this afternoon, injuring at least six people. Aerial video shows a white van on the sidewalk outside a corner building in the mid Wilshire neighborhood of central L.A. A fire department official says four people have been taken to a hospital and two others were treated at the scene. No word on their conditions. Well, on the day, Russian President Vladimir Putin said he is expelling more than 700 U.S. diplomats from Russia today. He also reviewed the Russian fleet at a Navy Day parade. Putin reviewed a parade of military vessels in Russia's second city, St. Petersburg, today. Putin congratulated Navy officers and sailors on board military vessels before the parade on the Neva River. The Russian leader said the naval fleet was making a significant contribution in the fight against terrorism. And some good news for frequent flyers of commercial airlines. The FAA is now under a federal court order to review the sizes of seats and legroom on commercial airlines. An advocacy group pushed for new rules regulating seat sizes. After the group's petition to the FAA was turned down in 2015, it went to the courts. Advocates argue small airline seats can put passengers' health at risk for conditions like blood clots in legs. Flyers rights offered evidence that the average width of seats has been cut by an inch and a half over the last decade. Taiwan-based contract manufacturer Foxconn will showcase its product line tomorrow at Waukesha Technical College. Then on, state lawmakers will gather tomorrow in Madison for a special session to consider legislation that would bring Foxconn to our state. Governor Walker's executive order requires the legislature to meet. Well, still ahead, the last night of EAA Air Venture. See how many spent the last day watching the world's famous air shows. But for now, a live look outside tonight, our Green Bay Cam. What's the weather looking like for the rest of your weekend and your work week? Your forecast coming up next. You're connected to NBC 26 News at 10 with Regina Ong, Matt Hoffman Weather, and Chris Barrier Sports. NBC 26 News at 10. Keeping you connected. And now, your Storm Shield forecast with NBC26 meteorologist Matt Hoffman. You definitely felt the difference in the air today. Much warmer and also much more humid. That was the big thing out there across northeast Wisconsin. And it's going to stay on the warm and humid side over the next uh, several days, at least through the middle of this work week. We also will have hit and miss storm chances. We saw a few storms pop up north of Green Bay today. That could be a little bit more widespread tomorrow and Tuesday. Then a soaking rain 
looks to be in our forecast now Thursday into Friday, something we're going to watch closely. In the meantime, things are quiet out there this evening. 69 degrees currently in Green Bay. It's 68, the current dew point, so very muggy air out there through the overnight hours. So a lot of folks probably turned back on the AC after some very cool nights over the last few nights. North Northwest winds this hour at five miles per hour in Appleton. We're still in the 70s, 72 degrees. That current dew point at 61 could see a little bit of patchy fog overnight tonight as well in a few spots. Temperatures around the area 65 up in Menominee, 64 for you folks in Mountain at 72 still in Wapaka, 71 degrees in Oshkosh and 73 currently in Mantuak. Wind speeds very light. Many spots reporting a calm wind at this hour and we're seeing dew points again on the muggy side throughout the area and that's the way it'll stay over the next couple of days and that will help fuel more spotty thunderstorms. We had some earlier but those have now fizzled out and we're just looking at mostly clear skies across the area. We do have a little frontal system up to the north but this area of high pressure has sunk to the south a bit and has weakened as well. And that's what's going to allow more of those storm chances here in the coming days, as well as an, as an approaching uh, frontal system, too. So tonight, things will be quiet. It'll be a dry start for your Monday, but it will be warm. Highs will climb into the 80s in the afternoon, humid as well. And then a few hit and miss showers and storms will pop up in the afternoon. Not going to be a washout. Should be good in the morning hours, though, if you're going to be heading to training camp for the Packers at 815, 70 degrees, sunshine, but it will be muggy out there. Here's a look at your forecast tomorrow. High temperatures, pretty warm. Many spots could flirt with 90 degrees or at least upper 80s, especially across central Wisconsin, mid to upper 80s in the Fox Valley. A little bit cooler along the lakeshore. Highs in the lower 80s, even up through Door County and then up to the north. Temperatures topping out in the upper 80s to potentially near 90 degrees in Shano. Tomorrow's UV index will be on the high side once again, up to an 8. So have that sunscreen if you're going to be out for a long period of time. Skycast looking like this, quiet through the overnight, a little bit of patchy fog in spots. As we go through the day tomorrow, notice heading into the afternoon with the daytime heating, hit and miss showers and storms popping up. Nothing severe expected, but we will get some heavier downpours and some lightning with that. As we head into the evening for tomorrow night, things will quiet down. We start off quiet on Tuesday, sunshine through the day, and then a frontal system is going to approach, and that will touch off more scattered showers and storms as we head into later Tuesday, into Tuesday night, and then also on Wednesday. Rainfall forecast not going to add up to much over the next few days, but then look what happens Thursday into Friday. A soaking rain looks to be on the way with a storm storm system that will be developing out to the west. But after that, it does look like it's quieting down. Good news for Packers family night on Saturday. At this point, it looks dry, but we, of course, will keep you posted as we get closer. Tonight down to 63 degrees, a few clouds, muggy, milder. Tomorrow up to 87, warm and humid. A few hit and miss isolated showers and storms through the afternoon. We'll have more rain and storm chances Tuesday and Wednesday but a steady widespread rain Thursday into Friday. And with that rain will come some wind as well as cooler temperatures. Regina, highs on Friday likely won't make it out of the 60s. I'm a little nervous because you said soaking rain and I haven't heard that before. So what is it that? Just, exactly? I mean, it just means that we're going to see a, a long period of like just extended rain. From the It'll car be to the dreary. door, just running. Yeah, you're going to need to run. You're going to need to run when <laughs> you're run. out doing your stories this week. <laughs> All right. Yep. All right, Matt, thanks so much. Well, still ahead, Art in the Park celebrating 57 years today, and tonight hundreds of artists show off their best work. Well, it's officially come to an end. The EAA Air Venture wrapping up today, but of course, with a bang. Among some of the performances today were the Red Line Air Shows and U.S. Navy Blue Angels. Organizers say some of this event has been the busiest to date. Well, this event has been the busiest today with the most people and many coming from all over the country. Those who stopped in this week say they'll be back again next year. Something that was just super memorable was watching the two B-29s in the pattern flying over Oshkosh, Whitman Field. And my understanding is it's the only two B-29s flying in the world. So that was like a very special moment that I'll never forget. Very special indeed. Well, this was Nelson's third year and says he'll be back again next year. 
Today was the 57th annual Art at the Park in Appleton. Nearly 200 artists from across the country showed off their best work along with live music, food vendors, and activities for kids. It's an event brought on by the Trout Museum of Arts, and even some awards were given out, including the best two- and three-dimensional artists. Other than displaying great artwork, it was also a chance for some families to come out and enjoy the day with free admission. There were over 20,000 people who walked through. It's really great. I mean, to be able to open art up to everyone who just wants to walk up and participate is really um, part of the mission of the Trout Museum of Art. And just to having everybody out together as families enjoying art, nothing could be better. Watercolors, ceramic pieces, basket and jewelry making. Jurors picked out the best in show and received $1,000. The winner received $1,000. Well, thank you for spending your Sunday night with me. Stick around for Sports Rewind. That's coming your way next. We kicked off training camp. Set! Hit! Exciting time, a lot of energy in the building, and I think it's going to be an extremely competitive camp. I mean, I'm excited. This is a fun part of the year. This is a very good locker room. Guys are going to compete. Guys hold each other accountable. And every time we go out on the field, we're going to push each other to the limit. It's a new year, baby. We got new goals, new identity. It's pretty clear that every time we, we step in this building, we're thinking about winning a championship. They already know we're coming here. We're coming for blood, and that's just what it's about. Doesn't that get the blood pumping just a little bit? Welcome to Sunday Sports Rewind. I'm your host, Chris Barrier. The Green and Gold are back in town for training camp, and what better way to catch you up on the first week with a little cheese and Packers? We're back with our third installment of Cheese and Packers. Chris Barrier, Kelly Price, and happy to be joined once again by our Packers insider from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, Michael Cohen. Mike, good to see you on the show again. Yeah, thanks for having me back. It's Absolutely. fun now that football's here. Absolutely. Football is here, my friend. We got lots of cheese to eat and lots of football to talk about. The Packers training camp's in full swing. The guys are in full pads, and one group that that benefits probably more than anybody else is the new running back core. What have you seen from the running game so far? Yeah, Saturday was a really big day for the running backs, and Mike McCarthy pretty much said that once the pads go on, that's when you can find out what these guys can really do. And it's really important for them for a couple of reasons. First, in addition to all their blocking assignments, you know, they have to protect Aaron Rodgers. And then second of all, any of those guys that can stay on the field all three downs, so the guys that can pass, catch, and block, gives the Packers the ability to access that no huddle, that up-tempo that makes them so dangerous. Ty Montgomery, what did you see from his pass protection? He said to us in, in an interview, he was like, look, I'm not going to apologize for things I don't know how to do yet. Is he there? Is he ready for that role? No, he's not ready yet, and that's going to be something to watch, especially in the exhibition games. Now, this is a guy that was basically thrown in the fire partway through the season last year when Eddie Lacy and James Starks had injury problems. So he's really doing this for the very first time. And I think he took five reps in the pass protection drill, and three of them were not very pretty to look at. So this is a guy that has some strides to make and some improvements to make, and to his credit, he knows that that's the case, and he's not necessarily going to be defensive about it. Another key on offense is going to be the tight end group. Obviously, that's a group that's gone through a lot of changes this offseason. They add Martellus Bennett and Lance Kendrick. So that top trio looks a lot different. 21 years of combined experience, though. What have you seen from them? Are you, what are you expecting to see from them throughout camp? So this gives the, the Packers offense a totally different dimension. And it's not to say that they didn't have tight ends that were capable in the past, but the fact that they have three guys that all have sort of three distinct skill sets allows Mike McCarthy to have a lot more freedom. So you look at Martellus Bennett. He's a great receiver, but he's also the best blocker and arguably the best blocking tight end in the league. Lance Kendricks is a guy that can line up all over the formation. He can line up in the slot. He can line up in the backfield as a fullback. And then Richard Rodgers has tremendous hands. And so he's a guy that's not going to beat you with athleticism necessarily. But if you get in down into the red zone and you need a catch in tight spaces, Rodgers' hands are tremendous. Switching gears to the defense, the secondary has a totally new look as well for the Packers. What's going to make them better in this department? Because obviously they need to improve from last season. I think speed is the number one thing that's going to help them there. And that's part of the reason why they drafted Josh Jones, you know, a rookie safety who has the ability to not only be one of the strongest and biggest players in that unit, but also the fastest. And then you look at guys like Kentrell Bryce, who mixed in toward the end of last season, another guy that runs in the 4-4 range. And then, of course, Kevin King, the rookie cornerback, another guy in the 4-4 range that gives you height and speed. So it was very clear after some of the painful losses, especially Atlanta in the NFC Championship game, that this defense needs speed, and that was addressed in the secondary. Michael, I'd like to call your attention to our middle cheese here. This is the Colby Jack, and I'll tell you what, it's a little spicy. It packs a punch. It brings a hit. 
And you know who else can bring the hit? Is Josh Jones. We saw it in practice. The guy leveled fellow rookie Malachi Dupree. Some of the guys take, took note of that, uh, Richard Rodgers in particular. But is it such a bad thing when we see a guy hit somebody like that? You know, I think it depends who you ask. If you ask Mike Daniels, who's sort of that smash mouth leader, he'll say, well, this is exactly what we thought he was going to be, mm -hmm. a guy that's going to come in and be really physical. And I don't think it's necessarily a bad sign. Well, let me ask you this. Is, is he going to be a difference maker for the Packers this year? He certainly has the potential to be. And I think the faster he is able to get onto the field, in other words, the sooner the coaches trust him, the better this defense will be because he gives them a physical presence that pretty much only Morgan Burnett can match in terms of the ability to play safety and also move up a little bit into the box and play sort of that hybrid linebacker. But different from Burnett, he has speed. And, you know, the fact that he's one of the bigger guys in the secondary, it doesn't take away from the fact that he ran 4-4-1 and he's still the fastest guy in the secondary regardless of his size. First week is in the books. Orientation kind of complete. What do we want to see now moving into the second week of training camp? Yeah, so there's various checkpoints along the way that Mike McCarthy and his staff use as benchmarks. And one of the key ones is family night. You know, it might sound silly because it is just a practice, but Saturday night when the Packers go into Lambeau Field for their big practice in front of 75,000 people, it's a huge chance for them to evaluate the younger guys and look at their composure and see how they handle a big stage with lots of lights, with screaming fans, where you have all the distractions that can possibly get in the way. Football is back. There's lots to talk about, and we still got lots of cheese to eat. Michael, thanks so much for joining us, and please help yourself to some cheese. All right, plenty more action coming your way after the break. We'll check in on the Brewers and Cubs and hear from Bud Selig, who was indicted, inducted rather, into the Baseball Hall of Fame. Stick around. Welcome back to the show. Let's talk some Brewers baseball. The crew hoping to take two out of three against the Cubs at Miller Park. Down 2 nothing in the six. Not anymore. Domingo Santana sends a liner over the wall and right. It's a two-run shot and it ties the game at deuces. John Lackey can't believe it. But that's where all the fun came to an end. Top of the seventh, Victor Caratini knocks his first homer over the porch in center. And Chi-Town is back on top. More trouble in the eighth. Chris Bryant. Solo shot. I'll raise you another. He pulls it down the left field line, doinks it off the foul pole. That still counts, though. So the Cubs win it 4-2. to two. The Cubs and Brewers, two teams headed in very opposite directions since the All-Star break. The Cubs are 13-3. The Brewers are just 6-11. And, and now Milwaukee, two and a half games back in the NL Central. Wisconsin native Bud Selig served as the MLB commissioner for 22 years. He handed out Hall of Fame plaques each and every year over that span. But today, it was his turn to take home some hardware. Selig was one of five members inducted into baseball's Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York. Born in Milwaukee, educated at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, Selig is a staple of the Badgers state sports community. Prior to serving as baseball's commissioner, Selig was the Brewers' general manager and saved baseball in Milwaukee by bringing the bankrupt Seattle Pilots here in 1970. Still one of his greatest accomplishments today. When the Brewers arrived March 31st, 1970, will forever be one of the proudest days in my life. The Hall of Fame is the soul of baseball. For so many years, I sat right behind where I stand now and watched as each new member would stand here and deliver remarks with a kind of emotion that comes with great happiness and fulfillment. Now as I stand here at this moment, I am humbled. I am deeply honored to receive baseball's highest honor. Also inducted to the Hall of Fame today, Jeff Bagwell, Tim Raines Sr., Pudge Rodriguez, and John Schurholz. Well, that does it for this edition of Sunday Sports Rewind. For Kelly Price and our entire production crew, I'm Chris Ferrier saying goodnight, and thanks so much for watching.